So my name is Sarah Bostic, and I'm the Sustainable Agriculture Extension Agent with the University of Florida in both Sarasota and DeSoto counties down here on the uh, kind of central west coast of Florida. Here we go, and thank you so much um, all for being so interested in this topic um, and for joining us. Um, so regenerative agriculture in landscaping is, um, it's, a pretty, it's a pretty new subject, a pretty new topic. Um, and when I, when I actually um, teach this subject in person and talk to folks in, in person, I usually ask, you know, who's, who's ever heard of regenerative agriculture? And in general, in a room of about 50 people, I might get, maybe get one or two uh, folks that have heard this term before. Um, and, um, but I think that this is a term that you're uh, right on the verge of, a, of hearing a whole lot more about on a much more regular basis. Um, when I was in college um, 20 years ago, the word sustainable and sustainability was, um, was really new. There was a lot of people that really didn't use it in the way that we use it now today. And I think regenerative um, is a word that's going to become really similar um, to how the word sustainable has progressed over time. So let's dive in and, and, um, and just start with, so what, what is this whole concept of regenerative agriculture? And the easiest way to think about regenerative agriculture is that it's really simply just a collection of practices that restore degraded land. That's really what the focus of regenerative agriculture is. It's to literally regenerate something that has been um, lessened in some way. And the most typical list of, of practices that get lumped under this idea of regenerative agriculture are the ones that you can see right there on your screen. And it's this idea of um, not actually tilling the soil, which for a lot of people is kind of a wild, wild and confusing concept. So we're gonna really deep dive, dive deep into what that means. And then um, the rest of these are seem to resonate a little bit more easily with people. It's um, things like using a diverse cover crops. Um, and for those of you that don't know what a cover crop is, um, it's literally a, um, a, a crop that you plant, that a farmer would plant um, between harvested crops that's there just to keep soil stable, just to keep your soil covered um, and to add nutrients back into the soil. It's not a crop that you intend to harvest, um, but this is becoming a much more commonly used practice across farms. Um, and then some of the other practices that go into restoring degraded land are things like making sure that we're minimizing the amount of fertility that's coming off of the farm by actually creating that fertility on the farm. Um, minima minimizing our use of pesticides, synthetic fertilizers in general, um, rotating crops around so that they, they don't, you don't have the same crop year after year after year on the same little spot of land. Um, and then the last piece is managed grazing. So instead of just letting livestock just kind of run, run free over a big open pasture, it's breaking a pasture down into smaller parts and, and very actively um, and intentionally managing how long animals stay on a particular piece of land so that it, the grass doesn't get tired. So all of, all of those things I just talked about are, tend to be really specific to agriculture, but the, but the basic principles you can absolutely also boil down to landscaping and how we manage our urban spaces, um, our backyards, our front yards, um, our, our parklands, those sorts of things. So today I'm gonna weave back and forth between agriculture and landscaping, like our, our own living spaces. So if you want to really dive deep into this, um, this subject of regenerative agriculture, um, especially as it relates to climate change and carbon sequestration, this is a pretty new book. Um, it came out about a year and a half ago, I believe. Um, it's, um, it's a pretty tremendous book. It's about 600 pages long and every single page of it is just packed with really good information. So I'm going to start um, by kind of actually panning back a couple of hundred years. Um, so right now we are in a state of affairs in which we are as a society are starting to realize that we need this idea of regenerative agriculture. So why, why do we need to regenerate our agricultural land and our, and our landscape spaces? Well, it's basically we, we as a society, as human beings, we have been, um, we have been agriculturalists for thousands and thousands of years. And 
and it's only only recently that we're starting to truly understand the really deep impacts that the way we go about agriculture um, is having on on land and on our ability to continue um, managing land well. So I like to I like to pan back just a couple hundred years because this was a real like paradigm shift time in in the history of agriculture across the world. So prior to the 1800s, um, we didn't actually precisely know what made plants grow. And in the late 1800s, uh, chemists had a major breakthrough and discovered that um, particular elements were really essential for the, for the growth of plants. And, and in the late 1800s, what they really discovered was the importance of nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus. And it sounds really dramatic to say this, but that discovery really kicked off um, a period of um, an altered geopolitical history of our world. And, and one of the, and really like where that statement comes from is that when scientists discovered that nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus were essential for plant growth, they also figured out that one of the very best sources for, for those nutrients was from poop, was from manure, um, and especially bird poop. And um, the best place to get bird poop was in remote islands all over the Pacific and Atlantic Ocean, um, where for thousands of years, birds had been roosting out on small rock strewn um, islands. And so entire, entire civil wars have been taught, civil and international wars have been fought over the acquisition of bird poop um, that all came from our understanding all of a sudden that nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus were so essential for, um, for, the, for the growth of plants. So if you want to learn more about that, there's a really great podcast um, called 99% um, in Invisible and a particular episode called Guano Mania. It's really good. So I like to talk about, um, to, to, to kind of um, put things in the perspective of other, other things maybe that we have interacted with in life. And I know as a kid, I desperately wanted an easy bake oven set. Um, I think most people know what an e easy bake oven set is. Um, and it's that basic um, like little kid kitchen where you, you mix this and that and then you stick it into your little plastic oven and a little while later, some, something comes out of it that you can eat, right? And so my, my mom happened to be um, uh, trained as, um, from a, a French baker and there was no way, no way she was gonna let an easy bake oven into our household, um, no matter how much I wanted that thing. But for me, it, this is a really good, um, really good way to compare um, what we understood um, up until very recently of soil. So until very recently, our, ba our basic understanding of soil is that soil is simply the medium that plants grow in, right? And to make them grow really well, we just add enough water, enough fertilizer, and then sometimes those plants need some pesticides. And then a few months later, we can harvest, right? You know, and so, you know, obviously, um, agriculture is not as simple as that. But that, if you really boil it down, that's, that's basically the premise of understanding that we have been using for a very long time um, around how we, how we do agriculture and how we do landscaping, right? Those, both of those things, it's, that's, how we, that's how we take care of plants. So very recently, like in the last decade, we have, we as a, um, you know, like as, as the planet Earth and all of the um, agricultural scientists within it and, and um, soil scientists and microbial scientists, have really, really been pulling out incredible amounts of understanding of what's actually happening in our soil. Um, and just leaps and bounds of understanding that have come over the last decade. Um, these are two really great resources for learning more about some of those recent, um, recent understandings of how incredible and amazing our soil actually is. And I'll send all these out as well as, a, um, as, a, as an email. Um, I'm going to send a, an attachment with a resource list to an email that I'll send tomorrow. So that's, you know, that's basically where we, how, like the perspective that we've been coming from for a really long time um, about how, how we manage um, soil and plant systems, right? It's kind of that easy bake oven idea of you add the basic things that the system needs and then out comes the product that you want. 
But at, with all of this new research and this understanding and observation, um, we're starting to really see the impacts of, uh, of that kind of, um, of management, land management, whether it be agriculture or landscaping or just your backyard. And so another analogy, um, I, so I have, a, I have a really good friend who um, many years ago, um, she worked for a, um, a homeless shelter and in one year there was um, an, an outbreak of tuberculosis and she, um, she acquired tuberculosis. Um, and had to be on a very um, intense course of antibiotics for about six months. Um, and it absolutely wreaked havoc with her body's flora and fauna, her digestive system and all sorts of things. And so she had to, over the, over the next year, had to really actively be part of building her body's natural flora and fauna back up because she'd destroyed it all with, with six months straight of antibiotics, right? And so to me, that's a really good parallel to what regenerative agriculture and landscaping practices are all about. It's saying, okay, we've, we have this damage and we know what caused it and we know what we need to do to rebuild it. And so let's, let's start that process of rebuilding the health of our soil. And it just so happens that that same exact process of rebuilding health of our soil um, also captures a lot of carbon. And I'm guessing that some of you may be really familiar with the term carbon sequestration. And if not, we will um, go into that in just a second. Um, but I'll pause right there. Are there questions, Katie? There is one question okay. and it is, could you use phyla notiflora as a cover crop? Phyla multiflora? Notiflora, N-O-D-I. F-L-O-R-A. I don't know, actually. I'm not sure what, what that one is. Is there a, what's the common yeah, name? I say, Sarah, <laughs> yes. um, that, that actually makes a really great ground cover. It's matchstick weed. You might have heard oh, of it. Yes. That, yeah, so it could be probably a cover crop. Thank you, Wilma. Wilma is our, our Florida-friendly landscaping um, coordinator in our office um, and absolutely brilliant with plant names in both English and Latin. <laughs> Um, thank you very much, Wilma. So yes, mass, matchstick weed. If you are a Florida, um, you're based in Florida, you have probably seen matchstick weed all over the place and maybe never noticed it um, and maybe never knew the name of it. Um, but look that, look that one up and you'll probably recognize it. Um, it's a beautiful little native ground cover um, and it's a, a wonderful one in landscaping systems. I've never seen it used as a cover crop on, on farms, um, but that's a, really, that's a really interesting idea. Um, and I wonder if anyone is doing any research into using some of our native ground covers as cover crops in agricultural systems. I'm actually gonna, I'm gonna make note of that and see if anyone is um, doing any of that sort of research. So thank you for that question. And that was okay. the only question so far. Great, thank you. Is my sound okay so far? It's been great. Okay, excellent. I feel like I'm hovering like right in front of my computer screen. So, <laughs> um, um, okay. So, some of you, um, I know some of you who are um, who joined us today have um, have taken my um, my understanding your soil class. So I'm not going to go nearly as deeply as I do in that two hour class all about soil. Um, but I want to just really quickly um, dive into what soil is and what it's composed of so that we have a basic foundation for what the rest of this talk is gonna be about. So soil, um, you know, like when you pick up a handful of soil, um, some people call it dirt, some people call it soil, whatever you call that, um, what is in your hand, um, regardless of what it looks like where you are in the world, it's composed of basically um, the pie chart that you see on the left, basically this proportion of things. So about 25% about or so of what is sitting in your hand by volume is actually air. Um, soil, good healthy soil contains a lot of air. Um, and then 25-ish percent, and clearly this, this number varies a lot depending on how recently it's rained, but around 25% of the volume of what's in your hand is water about 45% is mineral. Um, and when I say mineral, um, for most of Florida, when I say mineral, what, what that translates to is sand. Um, and for other parts of the country, it might be um, silt or um, clay. 
And then 5% of what is sitting in your hand, and this, this number also varies a bit, but about 5% of what's sitting in your hand is organic matter. And we'll get into what organic matter is um, in just a moment. But that, that's, a ba that's basically what um, the proportions of healthy soil right there. So this is a picture, um, the picture on your left, um, of soil from all different parts of the world. And most people, um, I'm guessing most people on this call would not look at these 16 pictures of soil and pick out a soil that looks particularly like the soil in their own backyard um, or particularly look at the soil and think that any of it looks really healthy. But somewhere in this world, this is normal, native, healthy soil. So there's a, you know, a huge, huge um, variance in what, what good, healthy, native soil looks like. But what is true of all soil across the world, regardless of what it looks like or where in the world it is, is that it, it is, um, it's in very specific layers. And this, um, this little drawing that you see on the right side of your screen, this is what soil looks like across the world. Um, each of the layers is, is a different depth um, and is composed of slightly different things, but all soil around the world is composed in these very specific layers. The top of the top bit of which is the litter layer. You know things like leaves that are decomposing or plant matter that's breaking down, things like that. Um, and then on on down all the way down to bedrock. So here's a couple of pictures of what that actually looks like if you dig an extremely big pit somewhere and then take pictures of it. On the left side of your screen, um, this is a soil pit of um, Mayaka fine sand, which is the predominant soil type in the Sarasota area of Florida, where, um, where our office is. The picture on the right, I actually can't remember where this picture is from, my apologies. I remember it's somewhere in the United States, but I can't remember the origin of this picture. Um, but you can see those incredibly distinct layers, right? And I promise all of this is gonna connect back in to this idea of regenerative agriculture and landscaping, if you stick with me. So here's another, this, I love this picture. The actual quality of the picture is not great, um, but it matches up so nicely with the actual layers in the diagram. Um, and this is what um, normal, um, the normal so soil profile for the southeast part of Florida tends to look like. Um, and you can actually see a little, little animal burrow that's pulled one layer of sand down into another. Um, it's, it's pretty amazing. Once you start looking at pictures of soil pits from around the world, um, just seeing these really distinct layers. So remember that very top layer of, um, of, of soil. Um, that top layer of soil is that litter layer, right? And that litter layer is the beginning of something that's incredibly important to soil, which is that approximately 5% of the pie chart um, of, of what composes soil being organic matter, right? Um, so organic matter, the easiest way to think about organic matter is that it's anything that is or once or, or, or is or once was alive, right? So that could be something that truly is still alive, um, you know, like all the little critters that are running around on top of the soil, um, all the way through things that have fully decomposed and stabilized um, in the soil, in a chemi chemically speaking. Um, so why, why is organic matter, you know, it's only about 5% of the total volume of soil. So why, why is that little 5% or so, so incredible? Well, this is what's so incredible about organic matter. So organic matter is the part of soil that holds water. Without organic matter, soil really doesn't have a, a capacity to hold water. It just washes right through. This is also the part of your soil that captures and holds carbon. And that is incredibly key for carbon sequestration. And we're gonna, we'll come back around again to this whole idea of carbon sequestration, um, which is a really big player in helping to mitigate the impacts of climate change. So organic matter is also the part of your soil that captures and holds all of those nutrients that are needed by plants. Organic matter helps to prevent erosion, mitigate flooding, and it is home to the most biologically diverse part of our entire planet, right? Soil, soil is truly amazing. And when organic matter goes away, so do all of those things on that list, right? So it's really small in volume, um, but it has a major impact. 
Um, and you can see on this little, little diagram um, on the right side of your screen that uh, for every 1% increase in organic matter, um, you get as much as 25,000 gallons um, of, of water that can be held in a single acre of land. That's amazing. That's a truly amazing thing. Um, so that is the power of organic matter. And via carbon sequestration, organic matter is directly connected to climate change. And I'm gonna show you how in just a sec. So, so organic matter, sometimes if, you, if you're looking in scientific papers, you'll see it written as soil organic matter, or it's often just abbreviated to SOM. So I'm just gonna call it organic matter for, for ease of, of communication. But organic matter is composed of about 58% carbon, right? So the way that, the way that, that gets calculated is that um, soil organic carbon times this multiplier of 1.7 gives you your total organic matter. And then you can you know, reverse do that math. So the higher the organic matter in your soil, the more carbon it can store, or the more carbon it does store. And so for every 1% increase of soil organic matter, there's about eight and a half tons per acre of additional carbon that can be sequestered, AKA like pulled out of the atmosphere and put back down into the, to the soil. That's a lot, that's a very big amount for a 1% increase in organic matter in one acre. And so I know that I don't visualize tonnage very well. So I did some calculations um, and it turns out that eight and a half tons per acre is the equivalent of the weight of three standardized pickup trucks. So imagine three standardized pickup trucks made of pure carbon. And that's how much 1% increase in organic matter in one acre of soil can pull out of the atmosphere and capture and hold onto. That's pretty, that's pretty powerful. I know that you cannot see this, um, this very well. This is, um, this is from a website. And when I actually um, found this, I had to zoom in on really particular parts of the screen to be able to really see it. But I, um, I'll send this out as a link also. So what you are looking at is a map of the parts of our country, excuse me, the parts of our world, oops, um, there we go, that have, uh, oops, something strange just popped up on my screen. Hold on one sec. Okay. Um, this, the organic, the, the carbon sequestration capacity of um, different soils around the world. The darker the color on, on each of the continents, the more, um, the more organic, um, excuse me, the more um, carbon sequestration that soil has the capacity for. So you can actually see that Along, um, there we go, along the coastlines in places like that, where you wouldn't necessarily think of as being parts of the world that could hold a lot of carbon, because we generally have soils that are fairly low in organic matter. But those are, those are really wet areas, you know, those marshy kinds of areas. And those marshy kinds of areas are very high in organic matter, as are wetlands. The, the lighter colors on the map are the desert areas. Those have very low organic matter and so have very low ability to sequester carbon. So what this shows you, if you just kind of look at it um, from afar and not try to read the tiny, tiny words on the screen, is that there's, it's really not an equal opportunity um, tool, right? This ability for soil to sequester carbon across the planet is, is different in different places. And so there are parts of our planet where it's, it's really important to embrace this idea of regenerative agriculture, of, of very intentionally putting carbon back into the soil, in soils that, that have a lot of ability to actually hold that organic matter. And you probably also can't see, but down here there's a list, and I, I promise I'll send you this, but these are the 10 countries in the world that have, that hold more than, that collectively hold more than 60% of the total soil organic carbon stock in the world. Um, and um, Russia is actually number one. Russia has uh, about 20%, um, followed by Canada and then the United States, China, Brazil, Indonesia, Australia, Argentina, Kazakhstan, and the Democratic Republic of Congo. Those 10 countries hold 60% of all the soil organic carbon in the world. That's pretty incredible. 
So to sum that up, I think the takeaway message with that is that we, we have the ability to build or destroy organic matter, right? We, this is something that we, we as a society, through the choice, the land, um, the land management choices we make, whether it's our backyard, our public spaces, our agricultural systems, we have the ability to either build or destroy that organic matter. And that organic matter is a very powerful piece of pulling carbon back out of our atmosphere and keeping it sequestered in soil. So what makes carbon actually release from soil in the first place? So the number, what research has been very clear about is that the number one thing that results in soil losing its store of, uh, of, of carbon is actually turning soil, right? And remember those pictures of the layers, those really distinct layers of soil? When, when we turn soil, we are actually mixing up those really, um, those, those really important layers in soil. We're, we're undoing the layers that nature created. And turning soil can happen in so many ways, right? Like farmers obviously turn soil with tractors. Um, and, and, and I think I forgot to say this in the very beginning, but I, I actually farmed for 16 years. I was um, a vegetable farmer for 16 years. Um, and so I have turned a lot of soil with tractors. You know, so this is, this is in no way me pointing fingers at all. This is something that I have done for many, many years. Um, this is how I made my living. I made my living turning soil and growing vegetables for many years. I also love gardening. I've done plenty of turning soil um, on a garden scale um, with things like a rototiller, a shovel, and a pitchfork, right? So any amount of turning soil results in some amount of carbon being released from that soil back up into the atmosphere. So regardless of how we turn it, the result is the same. Organic matter in that process of turning, um, organic matter is destroyed, carbon is released, that soil's ability to sequester more carbon is damaged, soil microbial life dies, weed seeds start to germinate, and then the whole system becomes more reliant on human intervention to make it work, right? And I don't know about you, but there are many things that I would like to do with my life um, besides constantly keep up with weeds and soil that is, um, is not healthy. Um, I, love, I love growing things um, enormously, um, but I want to work with natural systems to do that. And one of, the, one of the most important ways to go about that is to start to wean ourselves as a society away from actually turning soil, from inverting soil. So there's a few different ways that that, that happens, right? Or there's, there's many different ways that that happens, actually. And sorry for the quality of these pictures. Um, I, um, I don't have great access to, um, to open sourced pictures um, for some of these concepts that I wanna share. So I do my best with showing um, sometimes subpar pictures that I have, um, that I have the rights to use. Um, and um, these pictures fall into that category. Not the best pictures in the world, but hopefully you get the idea. So in gardens or landscaping or your backyard, um, the way that, that um, getting off of that process of tillage tends to work is by using mulch, you know, and it may be something like layering up layers of mulch, um, like you can see on the right, on the left side of your screen. This is a garden um, that was made entirely with this concept of sheet mulching. Um, if you want to learn more about that, um, just um, look up the term sheet mulching and you'll see all sorts of things. I'll also send you some information tomorrow. And then farms. Um, this is actually a really, really growing movement within agriculture across the world. It's this idea of no more tillage on farms that have, have relied for, um, for decades, if not hundreds of years, on continuous annual tillage. And that's done with um, some pretty amazing new, um, new tractor equipment. It doesn't have to be fancy tractor equipment, um, but there's, there's ways to do it. Um, and so what you're seeing here is actually a, um, a corn crop that, was, um, that finished, was um, mowed down or rolled down, um, and then through that, that corn stubble that laid on the surface of the soil, uh, a crop of soybeans was drilled directly into the soil, and then it came up through that, that, that mulch that was created by the corn. 
Um, and so this is a system that you're starting to see more and more and more, especially in, in the parts of the world that grow a lot of um, our staples like grains, corn, soy, beans, and things like that. Um, so here's just a, an example. There's some wonderful videos, lots of images out there, none of which I, which I have the rights to, to access to actually show you on screen. Um, but if you, um, if you do an internet search for no-till, low-till, or conservation tillage, you can see some pretty, pretty neat equipment in action um, and some pretty darn neat images um, of what this, this idea of minimizing or completely stopping tillage looks like on a larger scale. So this is, a tra this is actually a pretty small scale rig. This is a farmer that is, um, has multiple pieces of equipment going at the same time on one tractor. So on the front of the tractor is an implement called a, um, a roller crimper. And it's a very heavy weighted piece of equipment that has um, um, kind of like metal um, striations throughout it. And it rolls over a crop that is finished and it crimps the stems of that crop in multiple places so that the plant can't grow anymore. It doesn't disturb the roots, it doesn't damage the roots, it doesn't sever the top of the plant from the root system. Um, it just crimps it up and lays it flat right across the ground. And then on the back of the tractor, which you can see here, is um, first a series of metal cutting blades that come through and they're making um, very narrow cuts through that, that um, previous crop, which happens to be wheat, that's laying down there. And then behind, behind those cutting blades is another implement that comes through with, um, this one doesn't have a fertilizer um, um, apparatus on it, but it can, you can attach a fertilizer apparatus. So at the same time, it's spreading fertilizer in a very narrow band right into those cuts. Um, but then the implement that you see here is, um, is a grain drill. So it's coming right behind um, where those cuts are being made and literally planting the next, the next crop right in, right in there. Um, and so with a single pass of a tractor, you get, um, you terminate one crop and plant the next one. That's a pretty incredible thing. So not only is this a no-till system um, where the soil is not being disturbed, but you're also going into that field with large equipment um, a fraction of the amount of time that you would be if you were actually tilling. So this is kind of what no-till looks like in action. And Katie, it looks like we had some questions. Yes, we do. The first question is actually in reference to that slide you were showing of the maps for the different countries on it. We'll um, the, the question was, where does Israel fall on organic matter? It went from Ooh. desert to very fertile land. That's a great question. Um, this map is, is so hard to see. We'll have to um, <laughs> actually, um, this, is a, this is an amazing map. Um, this is a map that I actually would like to print out on like poster size to be able to see it really well. Um, but yeah, I mean, you can see this whole, oh, I can't find my clicker on here. This whole region of the world in here has a huge amount of variation, right? Between some of the most capable of, um, of sequestering carbon through some of the least capable of sequestering carbon. So I would have to really, really get zoomed in on that map um, to see, but I can, I can do some research and, um, and send some information out on that. Okay, thank you. The next question is, with the drop of physical newspapers, where do you get the basic material for sheet mulching? Oh, that's such a great question. Um, so for those of you who have, um, never heard of sheet mulching. Um, let me really quickly fill you in on why there's a question about newspapers um, as it relates to sheet mulching. Um, and so the idea of sheet mulching is um, that you basically are um, doing really accelerated, um, kind of an accelerated succession of, of, um, of your soil. So you literally layer up layers of things that you want to decompose. Um, you're, you're basically really amplifying that top, that top layer, all of which is um, sources of organic matter, right? And so as organic matter starts to decompose, it makes a really wonderful place for, um, for weed seeds to germinate and things like that. And so newspaper 
is an organic matter. It is newspaper once upon a time was very much a tree, right? And so it's organic matter. And ink in this country is now um, by law, um, bas basically for all practical purposes, it's soy based. So even the ink is, um, was once upon a time a, um, um, uh, alive. Um, and so newspapers are a really good way if you layer them as part of the sheet mulching system to, to prevent weeds from germinating through some of the other layers of, of mulch and, um, and decomposing organic matter that you've laid right on the surface of the soil. Um, and so once upon a time, newspapers, um, we all got lots of newspapers um, and newspapers were distributed everywhere. And so it was really easy to just grab a big stack of newspapers, um, get them wet and layer them up in your sheet mulching system. And that has definitely become harder um, so um, I, one of the things that I like to do actually, especially now that we have more cardboard boxes than we know what to do with, um, as we're doing so much online shopping, um, is that you can get those layer, you can get your cardboard boxes really good and wet so they're pretty soggy um, by soaking them in a big tub and use cardboard boxes in place of newspapers. And all of those glues that are, um, that are part of um, cardboard boxes. There's a lot of glue and sticky bits um, that hold it all together. Uh, a lot of decomposers in the soil, especially like worms, really love um, eating cardboard boxes. So that's a pretty good alternative right now. Awesome. And there is one more question. Uh, our community garden was shut down during COVID. It has reopened, but a couple of rows of raised beds are full of crabgrass. They want to convert to long rows. What is the best way to regenerate it to get it fertile? That's a great question. Um, that um, I will follow. I will follow up with you really directly um, on that one. Um, and I'll find um, whoever asked that question. Thank you for asking that question. I'll find your your email um, in the um, oh, what's it called? The Eventbrite. Um, all the event bright info you sent out, um, and if you can if you can share some pictures with me of the space, um, and is it a Sarasota um, community garden? And the reason I'm not giving a really concrete answer is because so many community gardens have really distinct um, um, rules about what you can and can't do in spaces. So I just want to follow up with more questions to make sure I'm giving you usable information as it relates to the actual community garden that you're in. Um, they didn't indicate which community garden, the user, okay. the name is user, um, I'm not, oh, there we go. Garden is part of University at um, the District of Columbia. Oh, okay. Sounds good. Yeah, we'll follow up, we'll follow up directly um, on that one. Thank you for that question. And that's it. Okay, sounds good. Okay, so I'm going to throw some really dense statistics out there. Um, and I promise I'm, I'm not gonna do a whole lot more on the, the dense statistics, but these are just some like, just some wild numbers. So statistics wise, there are two and a half trillion tons of carbon that are currently held in the top three feet of soil worldwide. That's a huge number, right? Um, that's, I don't even know how many pickup trucks that equates to, but a whole lot. Um, 560 billion additional tons of carbon are held in above ground living biomass and detritus. Um, basically what that means is um, all, the, all the plants and animals above the soil, of the surface of the soil. So an additional um, basically half trillion. So if you add those numbers together between the carbon that's held in the top three feet of soil wor worldwide and all of the carbon held um, above, above the surface of the soil, um, that's three trillion tons of carbon. That's huge, right? But actually in the grand scheme of things, it's, it's not the bulk of the carbon um, on planet Earth. Most of that is actually held in the ocean, which is pretty fascinating. And the very smallest bit um, if you could, that you can see here on this pie chart is actually held in uh, our atmosphere. And uh, about one and a half percent of all of the carbon on planet Earth is held in the atmosphere. And that's, it's important that that not increase, right? Because that when we are increasing the amount of carbon in our atmosphere, that's directly correlated to climate change. So how do we, 
how do we, you know, how do we keep that carbon um, where it is and how, how, is, how much of it is already shifted from, from soil over, over to the atmosphere? Well, here's, I think this is the last dense statistical page, um, but so historically speaking, most agricultural soils worldwide have lost 12 to 16 tons of carbon per acre since the beginning of humans starting, starting agriculture thousands of years ago, right? Since, since we as, a, as, a, as humanity started agriculture. And that's depending on where you are in the world, um, that's equal to 25 um, to 75% of what existed before land was initially cleared by humans long, long ago. Scientists estimate that since the start of agriculture, we've lost 320 billion tons of carbon from clearing land for agriculture. That's a lot. And that is very concretely, you know, a human caused um, source of, um, of carbon migrating from soil to, um, to our atmosphere. And so, you know, again, 320 billion tons. That's a lot, right? But what does that really look like? Well, that's the, that's the equivalent weight of 107 billion pickup trucks. Um, and um, as reference point, the entire planet only has one and a half billion vehicles in the entire world. So it is magnitudes more um, than the current number of vehicles, like the weight of the current number of vehicles on our entire planet that we've already lost because of clearing land for agriculture. That's a whole lot. So these numbers are crazy, right? He's like, who, so who wouldn't just embrace this idea of regenerative agriculture and landscaping? Because clearly we need to change something um, and we need to change something fast, right? So why isn't everyone doing this already? Well, there's lots of reasons. Um, and I'm going to dive into some of those reasons. So on the agriculture side of things, there's a lot of reasons that most producers are not doing this. Um, but I just really also want to highlight that a lot of producers actually are starting to do this. Um, so there's, there's different, different degrees of, um, of reduced or no-till. Um, one version is called conservation tillage, where it's significantly reduced tillage, um, and it's a really kind of um, specific pattern that all, is all laid out. And so just with conservation tillage, like very reduced tillage, there's already more than 306 million acres worldwide um, that are, that are, that are in conservation tillage. And then, you know, um, complete total no-till, that number is growing um, by leaps and bounds every year. Um, one of the reasons that a lot of farms still aren't doing it, for a lot of folks, they don't, re they don't really know much about it, right? It's, it's still a really new system. Another is that it's a really hard system to master without herbicide. Um, the, the process of rolling and crimping to, to kill the previous crop is pretty imperfect and it takes a while to perfect it. And so it's a hard system to master without herbicide. And so a lot of folks that would like to be going this regenerative agriculture route are kind of feeling like they have this cost benefit analysis of, um, you know, I can go, I can go organic or I can go no-till, um, but it's hard to do these two things together. Um, but that's, but more and more research is being done on organic no-till and low-till methods. So. It's all, it's in process. And then, and then of course, you know, both at home and in agriculture, there's a lot of reasons that we still turn soil. Um, and one of which is because that's how we've always done it, right? It's, you know, it's one of those things of, if you've always done it that way, then you always do it that way. Um, and if you don't know that there are other ways to go about managing your soil and your growing spaces, um, why would you make a change? Um, so. There's also simply that basic aesthetic, right? And this is something that, that groups like um, Florida Friendly Landscaping and, um, and many other, other groups and educational um, efforts are, are undertaking to help people start to embrace a different aesthetic, right? So like with our landscaping, we have these really specific aesthetics um, and in our garden spaces, really specific aesthetics. And not everyone likes the aesthetic of mulched soil. Um, or, or soil that's mulched with, um, with natural materials. So really starting to, to change what we see as beautiful is a really important thing as well. And so when I, when I was first putting this workshop together about a year or so ago, I, um, I kind of hit a, a roadblock and I went outside to our little demo garden at work with a cup of tea 
and I was standing under this big, beautiful old oak tree looking at this kale that I had direct seeded just a few weeks before. Um, and I looked down and that I'd put so much work into, so much work into this kale that just was not interested in growing the way I wanted it to grow. And I looked down at the little saying on my tea bag that I was sipping as I was trying to get inspiration for this workshop. And it said, nature does not hurry, yet everything is accomplished. And then I looked up at this oak tree that without, without our help whatsoever, had been growing there for probably a hundred years, perfectly happy. And, and, and I was literally standing next to this kale that I had put ridiculous amounts of time into growing as a good demonstration. Um, and so I was like, oh, there we go. That's, that's the inspiration that I needed for the next phase of this workshop. So the next, the next element is that we were so focused on things that happen quickly, right? So most of our food comes from annual crops and, and annuals for those of you that don't that don't um, that have trouble differentiating between some of these um, gardening terms an annual is a crop that within within a single year or less goes through its entire life cycle from seed all the way through maturity flowering and producing its own seed and then dying right so that's that's an annual crop meaning that you have to plant it again and again and again and that's one of the reasons that we as, um, as a planet are so reliant on tillage, because when you, when you have annual crops, every time one crop finishes, you have to do something with that crop. And so traditionally, historically, what we've done is till it into the soil. Um, so that's, that's, a, that's part and parcel, right? So the next word that you see on that screen is that we need to embrace perennial crops. And perennial is kind of the other end of the spectrum from annuals. So annuals have their entire life cycle in one year. Perennials um, live for multiple years, um, like two or more years. Um, and so in the picture that you can see right there, that oak tree is a perennial, right? It lives for a very long time. That kale is an annual. It does not live for a very long time. And the vast majority of the calories that we consume planet-wide are from annuals. And that, that's something that just inherently, it's, it's an inherently complicated thing, right? And so there's a lot of arguments being made right now in the scientific community and in the agricultural community and in the um, human rights communities and things like that about this need to embrace more perennial crops, crops where you plant it and then you get to harvest from those crops for many years um, before you need to do something to change to another crop. Um, the book that I showed you in the very beginning um, called Carbon Farming Solutions um, does an amazing job of highlighting about 700 different perennial crops from around the world. It's really neat. Um, and, it, and it does a really good job of diving into what, what about them um, is, is really good and what about them is really challenging. So the picture that you can see on your screen there is one of the, the many, many, many um, annual crops that we depend on. This is um, a field, an, an annual field of canola. Um, what's, it's, a, it's a plant that we, we generally call canola, turn into canola oil, um, and um, it's an annual. So the vast majority, you know, as I said, of, um, of the, the calories that we consume across the world are from, from annuals, and um, our oils are no exception to that. Most of the oil that we eat is from annuals as well. What is known is that we need a lot more research into perennials, into perennial food sources, especially those things that we grow in large open monocultures like this, um, things like grains, um, legumes, and oil, um, oil crops like, like canola. Because um, right now there isn't a whole lot of research that has been done about how we can um, create um, or develop um, or pull out of, um, out of history some perennial versions of things that we need as basic food staples. But there is research doing, happening. It just happens to mostly be privately funded. Um, there's not a whole lot of, of really broad research that's happening. Um, and scientists estimate that to take a single variety of an annual crop and using natural breeding, um, it takes between 10 and 40 years to develop a develop a perennial grain crop that has comparable yields to an annual grain crop. And that's a really long time. You know, that's like 
you know, up to 40, 40 years. That's, that's my lifetime um, to date um, of how long it may take to actually develop a single variety of a single crop um, into a perennial version of things. So this is my little shout out for um, the need for more research um, into perennial crops. This is a really, I just want to highlight um, a few different organizations um, throughout. Um, this is a really neat one. Um, it's called Badger Set Research Corporation. Um, they're based out of Minnesota. This is a, a father-son duo that has decided to dedicate their lives to doing research primarily on hazelnuts, which is the nut that you can see in the picture, um, but also to um, chestnuts, hickory, and pecans. And as, a, as an alternative, you know, based, as a perennial um, um, oil and protein source. For, for cold weather areas. Um, and they're, they're privately funded through donations and things like that. Um, so this is, um, that's a, it's a distinct need um, within this idea of regenerative agriculture is to actually develop more crops that can be used in a more perennial way. Okay, so to dive in a little more into this idea of why isn't everyone doing it? You know, so it's, you know, on the agriculture side, part of that is very distinctly that we don't actually have necessarily all the best resources in place, right? Like there's a lot of research that still needs to happen and a lot of trial and error and developing new varieties of things that work better with this idea of, re of regenerative agriculture. But not so much on the landscaping end. We have landscaping much better figured out. And so why, why isn't everyone doing this kind of regenerative way of managing their landscapes? It turns out there's a lot of really concrete reasons. So down here in Florida, one of those really concrete reasons um, is things like your, um, your HOA. So there's a lot of HOAs that have rules that, that, um, that prohibit certain, certain ways of landscaping or certain, um, certain um, things that you're growing um, and that, that don't align particularly well with this idea of a Florida-friendly yard. Um, there's also, um, just as a kind of across the board culturally in this country, a lot of our standard landscaping practices, those things that for whatever reason have become our aesthetic norm, um, they don't necessarily fit, fit the land very well, right? Our, so much of our landscaping is about bringing plants in from other places that don't necessarily naturally grow well where you've put them. And that, that inherently is not a particularly regenerative friendly practice. Um, we have a lot of cultural ideas about what a yard should look like. Um, and then I hear this all the time. Um, I really want to go with this Florida friendly landscaping idea, but I can't find a yard crew that understands what it is or a maintenance crew that understands how to do it or someone that will install it. Um, and so we need a lot more education within the landscaping sector about what this whole this whole um, Florida friendly thing is all about, um, or if you're from another part of the country or from another country, this, this idea of landscaping that really fits where you are, right? That's not, not a kind of generic idea of what landscaping should look like, but rather an idea of landscaping that actually fits your landscape, the natural landscape of where you are. And then of course there's like the, just the, um, we just don't have enough examples out there of different ways of doing things. And so we need more, more brave folks who will just give native landscaping or climate friendly landscaping a try um, to show people what is possible. Um, are there any questions up, up to that point, Katie? Yes, we have a couple. We have two actually. The first one is what does all the plastic pollution in the ocean do to ocean carbon levels? Ooh, that's such a good question. Um, I do not know, um, but there is somebody in our office who is, um, his name is Armando Ubea. He is the Sea Grant, sea Grant agent in our office, and I have a feeling that he does know the answer to that. So I will ask him, um, and if he doesn't know, he will know who does know, and I will get you that answer. And, and add it to the email resources I send out. Perfect, I'll make note of the name who asked the question. Thank you. The second one is, our property was formerly sprayed with Roundup. What is the best approach to healing the soil from years of chemicals? We have chickens, bees, and are planning to mulch the fields around the orchards. Awesome, that's great. Um, and really good question. So, um, round, so there's, there's two different 
categories of, um, of herbicides, and Roundup is an herbicide um, that specifically targets broadleaf plants. Um, so there's grasses, and then there's basically all the other plants called broadleaves. Um, and so Roundup um, is in a category of herbicides that are really short-lived. They have a, it has a very short lifespan. So you spray it, um, it's a matter of days before it's actually completely broken down and gone from the environment. Um, you know, so it, it's, it's just, it's really quick. It does not persist in your soil. It doesn't persist in the environment. There's another category of herbicides that are called persistent herbicides. And you need um, an, an, um, an applicator license to, to purchase and, um, and use that type of, that, that category of herbicide. Um, persistent herbicides stick around for quite a bit longer. Um, some, some of them for up to 10 years of, of effectiveness. Um, and um, in, in, in residential landscapes, um, it's very unlikely that anyone would be using um, an, an herbicide that fits into that persistent category um, because they are, they are um, regulated at the state level. Um, and so in general, the kinds of herbicides that are used in residential settings are those really short-lived herbicides, um, which is often why you, you find folks um, feeling the need to use them frequently, right? It's because they actually don't last very long. Their effect doesn't last very long. So it sounds like you're doing exactly the right thing um, in that you're, you're mulching, you're bringing in chickens, um, and you're just starting to, to build to build the life that you do want to be part of your property back into the mix. Um, you know, a, a property that, so actually, I, this is a story that I really, um, that I really love. So my grandfather was also a farmer. Um, he spent his whole, his whole life as a farmer in South Carolina, which is where I'm originally from. And um, he and I would butt heads all the time and we'd have these wonderful conversations, um, especially when I was, you know, very, very young and early in my days of being an organic farmer. I was actually a certified organic farmer and he was a conventional farmer. And we'd get into these really kind of heated headbutting conversations. And, um, and after, um, after he died, the space that he used at the end of his late life for a garden, which he had been um, spraying for with, with Roundup um, for, I think, if I remember correctly, something like 35 straight years um, on a schedule. Um, within, um, within a few months of when he died, um, and, you know, and so it no, no longer was spraying herbicide regularly on this piece of land that he was using as his garden, the entire half acre garden space was just a blanket of grass and other weeds that had just been waiting there in the soil to, to germinate. Um, and so um, life is there. It's, it's, it's waiting to, to rebound. Um, and, um, and so just you know like embrace that know that nature nature really is good at, at filling itself back in as long as um, persistent herbicides were not there um, were not being used on that that landscape those are, those are two very different categories of um, of herbicide um, so if you know if, if it was really residential herbicides that were being used your your natural system should start that process of building back pretty quickly there's probably a lot of seeds in the ground waiting to to break through the surface of the soil and um, see the light of day. Um, but yeah, you know, as much as you can, adding, adding in, um, you know, compost, um, worm castings, all sorts of good things to really get the microbial life jumping in your soil again. Any other questions pop up? Nope, that's it for now. Sounds good. Um, so, um, so you've probably been staring at this list while I've been talking, so I don't need to go through it very deeply, but this picture that you can see is actually um, a picture of one of the lakes at our office in, um, in Sarasota. And, and you can see that a lot of the, the, the landscaping around this lake is actually really nice where the trees come right, trees and shrubbery come right down to the edge. Um, but then there's also these open spaces where the grass has been mowed literally down into um, into the the lake, and so one of the you know one of the things that you can really be really make a big impact with in terms of how you manage your land, um, like your residential land, is if you abut water, um, whether it be a stream or a lake or you know a creek or any other sort of water, um, is by not mowing all the way down to the edge, 
you know, so if you have that buffer, um, after, when big rains happen, that buffer of, of shrubs or bushes or foliage or whatever, that will help the stop of soil being lost from the land down into the water, which ultimately actually releases carbon back up to the atmosphere. So really being conscious about how you're mowing. Um, and then, you know, ideas like um, planting living fence lines, right? We spend a lot of money in this, in this country putting up um, prefabricated fences and things like that. And while there's, you know, nothing, nothing wrong per se with prefabricated fences, um, living fences are pretty awesome. They're, they're beautiful, they're functional, they're, um, and they can be used for so many different things, um, you know, including if you have, you know, chickens or some goats or things like that um, in, your, in your yard, um, they can also potentially be things that um, are providing fuel, uh, excuse me, fodder, um, you know, food for those animals. Um, they also provide shade, um, and as they drop leaves, they're adding organic matter back to the soil, and that's something that a prefabricated fence just can't do. Um, so the picture on the, on the right is actually a picture um, from Florida. Um, we have a lot of a lot of development going in that looks kind of like this, right? Um, and that's a, you know, that, that, is one, that is one version of how development can look. And this is how a lot of new development does look. Um, and this is, a, you know, this is a type of development that, that clearly does not leave a lot of room for natural systems. Um, and, it is, it, and it clearly misses the mark in terms of, of things like regenerative landscaping practices, right? So I know that many of you are from places other than the Sarasota area of Florida, but um, for those of you that are in the Sarasota area of Florida, um, if you want to see a really neat, really, really neat alternative um, to, to what um, urban development can look like, there's a place called the Florida House in Sarasota um, that's, I think it's about a quarter acre lot, and the entire thing is, like, is an, a wild edible jungle. Um, it's, it's pretty darn neat. So I want to take you back up now. A lot of what I just laid down is kind of heavy, right? It was kind of dense, heavy, statistical, um, maybe a little anxiety provoking. But I want, to, I want to show you some examples of things that are going really, really well, um, things that we can gain a lot of inspiration from. And I love, I love this, um, this quote from the Secretary General of the United Nations that's saving our planet, lifting people out of poverty, advancing economic growth. These are one in the same fight. We must connect the dots between climate change, water scarcity, energy shortages, global health, food security, and women's empowerment. Solutions to one problem must be solutions for all. So I'm gonna take you through a series of things that I personally find really inspiring from other parts of the world that really fit these words of Ban Ki-moon. Um, and there's pieces from all of these that I think we can take and, and gain inspiration from for how we interact with our own spaces right here. And um, this, um, this is a screenshot from a website. So 20, I think it was actually exactly 20 years ago, um, I was in college and I was in, um, I was in, in India for the first time. And um, I was on this really amazing study abroad trip and I was studying um, ecology and social movements and sustainable development um, all over the world over the course of nine months and got to spend a couple of months in India. And about a week of that was spent at this place called Timbaktu, Timbaktu Collective. Um, and it is still to this day, one of the most inspiring places I've ever been. And um, the basic backstory, um, I'm gonna tell you a little backstory um, about this place. Um, there's a 30 minute video about this place um, called Timbaktu. That's not a misspelling, that is truly how it is spelled. Um, but they, they, the video doesn't, the video is amazing, but it doesn't give you the full, incredible, inspiring story of, of how truly amazing this, this place is, this, this um, Timbaktu. So the, when I went to Timbaktu, they'd actually only been in operation for about 10 years. They've now been in operation for about 30. And um, this man right here, his name is Bablu, and Bablu and um, a few of his friends were very educated and um, 
urban and inspired to make changes. And they were all in their late 20s or early 30s when they got things started. And they moved out of the city in, um, in India and moved to an inc a very, very rural, very, very poor part of India. Um, and they were gonna throw some seeds in the ground and grow food and start a social revolution. And uh, that didn't work out so well. Um, so it turns out um, the history of this land really tells the story of why that didn't work out so well. And the basic history of this land is that um, in the 1800s, um, during British colonialism, um, the British um, saw this region um, of, of India and it's, it's um, a dry tropical forest area. And it's, it was you know, super productive area and they decided it would be a really good place to, um, to put in teak plantations, like the, the, the wood that's called teak, um, that's used in a lot of ship making and fine furniture and things like that. And so they came in, the Brits came in, cleared huge amounts of land, um, replace the native landscape with um, teak plantations. And um, those teak plantations fairly quickly failed um, because the, the basic ecology of the land was so profoundly altered that it actually altered the entire climate of this, this region. And it went from being a dry tropical forest to a desert. Um, it basically, um, basically became um, a dead zone. Um, by the time Bablu and three of his colleagues moved out to this area with a handful of seeds and a lot of aspirations, there was almost no microbial life left in the soil and it almost never rained. It was a complete and total desert, which is exactly why they got their land for so cheap um, because it could not sustain life. And so they, the long story short is that they, um, they have spent the, the last 30 years figuring out how to regenerate this land and bring it back into productivity. And they have inspired a ripple effect movement across this entire region, where this entire region is becoming habitable again for all sorts of life, human and, and wildlife. Um, if you wanna watch a really inspiring 30 minute video, this is, this is the one, and I will, I'll send the link out to this as well tomorrow. Um, so another, another thing that really inspires me is this work that's being done around rice. Um, rice is an incredibly important staple crop around the world. Um, you know, every, almost every continent has at least a major part of the continent that relies very heavily on rice. And turns out that the traditional way of growing rice is actually um, has a pretty significant um, climate impact. Um, the traditional way of growing rice is in flooded paddies or flooded fields that are we, we call paddy. Um, that process of um, anaerobic um, flooded fields actually releases a lot of methane gas. So rice, you know, rice is a crop grown on a whole lot of land and the way it's traditionally been grown is problematic for the long run. So over the decades, um, starting um, and, and really became really solidified in the 1980s, is this the system called the system of rice intensification. Um, it's, it's such an uncatchy name. It's really kind of a bummer that um, it doesn't have a more catchy name because it's a real, it's a pretty incredible game changer um, of a system. And um, so right, um, SRI is its abbreviation um, for obvious reasons. Um, and um, so it was developed primarily in Madagascar in the 1980s. Um, and since then, it is, um, it's been adopted by over 10 million farmers around the world, uh, most of those in Asia, and most of them are smallholders, you know, folks that are not, not huge large scale farms, but folks that, are, that derive their, their, in, their family income directly from the land. And so there's a few different ways that SRI is different than the traditional um, flooded paddy system of growing rice. Um, and one is tr you actually transplant those rice seedlings rather than um, using just directly seeding into the flooded paddies. And then another is that you actually space the, all those plants, all those seedlings um, in a really particular pattern in wide rows. There's no continuous flooding. And then you use a, a special kind of hoe, um, like a hand, hand weeding hoe um, for the process of weeding. And it's also really important to add a lot of compost. And compost is basically just straight organic matter. When we were talking about organic matter before, 
um, a really um, a really solid source of organic matter is compost. Um, it's everything in compost is organic matter. So that's, that picture is a beautiful picture of a dragonfly on a nearly ripe um, head of rice. And so in, in, with SRI, another thing that has been shown is that uh, insect life and diversity in rice fields is starting to increase again. And there's some really concrete reasons for that, including that with this system, there's no chemical fertilizers or pesticides that are used. Um, there's also, and this is really important, there's no special seed that's needed. So a lot of really small holder farmers, um, they, can't, they can't afford um, expensive new varieties of seed um, or expensive inputs of chemical fertilizers and pesticides, right? They're, 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 very, they're very poor. And so having a system that doesn't require the purchase of, um, of expensive inputs or special seed is really key to this whole system. And it's been a big piece of the buy-in on this system with farmers. This is another really key piece. And it's that um, the this, this system of rice intensification uses 80 to 90% um, less seed than traditional paddy rice. Um, and that's because you're transplanting seedlings instead of just you know, broadcasting seed across the whole space and hoping that most of it germinates. And why this is important is that really small holders, people who actually truly are living hand to mouth, um, if they can plant 80 to 90% less rice seed than they were planting in the other, the other, in the other way, means that that's 80 to 90, that, that 80 to 90% savings of seed is seed that they can eat um, or sell to someone else to help actually provide for their own families. And then overall, this system uses 25 to 50% less water. That's huge. That's a really big, it's a really big savings in water. And then there is one thing though that does increase with the system and that's labor. And that's true across a lot of regenerative agriculture systems. And so you, you often will see an increase in labor, but that's often just like in the system of um, rice intensification balanced out by um, the increase in yield or the increase in value in some other way of that crop. So with, with the system of rice intensification, yes, it's increasing, the production cost increases by 50%, but the yield is so much greater um, than, than with traditional systems and the cost per unit of yield is, um, is just really different. Um, and so that's just a, just a little glimpse into um, the system. This is a picture of a traditional rice paddy um, as we mentioned before, um, traditional rice paddies are stay flooded um, and that releases a lot of methane gas. So there was a study that was done in Madagascar that found that the lifetime carbon sequestration in a um, SRI field is 150% higher than in paddy production, right? So the amount of carbon, so not only is, is the SRI system um, releasing less methane, it's also sequestering significantly more carbon than in the flooded paddy system. And then SRI rice yields are actually about double what the world average is in the flooded systems. So clearly, um, clearly there are some major benefits and farmers are understanding what those benefits are and they're embracing the system of rice intensification. This is another one, and, and I, love, I love asking folks, and I'm so curious, um, Ty, if, if you have ever heard of this, of this amazing woman, her name is Wangari Mathai, um, will you just type into the chat box and let me know that you have heard of her? Um, it is really rare when I talk to a group and mention her name that folks have ever heard of her. And I want more people to know about Wangari Mathai, um, who died, she died a few years ago. Um, but she was the first African woman and the first environmentalist to receive the Nobel Peace Prize back in 2004. And she, she's, pretty, she's pretty darn inspiring. She's also written a few books. Um, they're they're pretty, pretty amazing books. And one of them is her, um, her autobiography, which I highly recommend. So in the 70s, um, she's, she's a Kenyan woman or was, was a Kenyan woman. And she, she recognized that in Kenya, where she was from, um, there, there was a major, there's a major problem in the works. Um, and in the, in, across Kenya and across so much of the developing world, um, women um, are still cooking on, on fire, with fire, right? And so fire comes from wood and wood comes from 
trees, right? So women were spending huge amounts of time every day collecting firewood and stocks of firewood were becoming less and less available. And so women were spending more and more of their time collecting firewood and as tree, as, as areas of forest were being more and more degraded, there were all sorts of ripple effects happening, right? Um, so, like so many different ripple effects. And she was really noticing a lot of these ripple effects, you know, including that um, rain was becoming more patchy in certain areas and there was less wildlife to hunt and there were, you know, less foraging that could happen in the woods for wild, wild plants and, and, and other food sources. And so it was starting to have some really major impacts on these really impoverished regions of Kenya. And so in the 1970s, she started this process of trying to inspire women to plant trees across Kenya. And it turned into this thing that we now call the Green Belt Movement. Um, the Green Belt Movement started by Wangari Mathai. And it was so successful that it actually inspired the United Na Nations to launch a campaign that has led directly to the planting of 11 billion trees worldwide in areas that were starting to really suffer from deforestation. Um, so in a lot of the areas that Wangari Mathai was working, um, these areas were on their way to becoming desertified, just like the story of Timbuktu um, and um, the teak plantations, right? They were starting to become um, an, un, an unviable part of the world to live in. And through this planting of trees, that trend is being reversed. And that's a pretty tremendous thing. So hopefully all of you remember her name. Um, I, love, I love telling people about Wangari Mathai and this incredible movement that she started in an incredibly grassroots way. And then right here in the United States, um, there's all sorts of organizations across the United States that are doing um, research on regenerative agriculture. Um, the oldest, one of the oldest ones is the Rodale Institute. Um, for any of you from um, Pennsylvania, greater area, that, that sort of region of the country, you may have heard of Rodale Institute. Um, that is where it started in this country. And just in the last few years, Rodale Institute is now doing um, research on regenerative agriculture in other parts of the country. Um, just in the last year, they actually opened up a, um, a research station, like a working farm research station um, in Chattahoochee Hills, Georgia, just outside of Atlanta. So that's the first one in the southeast. And a really big piece of what the Rodale Institute does is, um, is research around how do we, how do we continue to, to hold um, livestock agriculture and crop agriculture together um, because more and more those things are becoming separate. Um, but plants and animals have always, always developed together, right? There's no, no natural ecosystem on earth where plants and animals um, don't coexist. And so a lot of, a lot of this idea of, or, of regenerative agriculture um, is starting to try to pull back this idea of having plants and animals in, in similar spaces. So on their, on their website, they, they, have, um, they have a blog that takes you to um, a series of interviews with really fascinating people. Um, and one of them was with um, a very recent article, a recent interview, that was an interview with a range ecologist named Dr. Richard Teague. Um, and it's an interview that is entitled, Cattle are Part of the Climate Solution. And I encourage you to read it. It's a really fascinating article. Um, and I'm, I'm guessing that most of you who are on this call um, have up until this moment in time, mostly heard that, um, that livestock and especially cattle are a major contributor to global warming and climate change, right? So hold on a second and we, we, will, we will, ad will address that. Um, and um, there's, it's, a, it's a really big topic right now. So I'll, I'll come back around to that topic in just a moment, but I wanna show you a couple more interesting and inspiring things. So um, you'll, you'll very often see the word organic and regenerative paired together. They are not one in the same. Um, I just wanna be really clear about that. They're not one in the same, but there are some organizations that are trying, trying to overlap those two things, um, organic and regenerative, um, to to really build on the most impactful parts of both of those things um, to create some pretty amazing capacity for land to, to, to heal and regenerate and pull carbon out of the atmosphere and things of that nature. 
Um, one of those groups is um, called Regenerative Organic Certified. They have been in the works for a few years, um, but they're still in very early stages. And they have been, for the last couple of years, been running a pilot program um, on Regenerative Organic Certified, which is a similar sort of idea to Certified Organic, um, but they're layering in um, a very specific set of requirements around regenerative. Um, so basically pushing those two things together. So just this month, for the first time ever, um, it's September 2020, um, Regenerative Organic Certified has moved from its pilot program and is now accepting applications from farmers for the first time ever um, who want to be um, certified as regenerative organic based on, based on this set of standards. Um, so if you want to learn more, this, the website is pretty neat um, and there's, there's all sorts of links that will take you down all sorts of really fascinating rabbit holes. Um, so I, I encourage you to investigate that if that is fascinating to you. Okay, so a little note on livestock. Um, so, and actually, Katie, are there, are there questions before I go on to the livestock bit? Maybe, maybe. And I know Katie had to step out at a couple moments, so I'll ask Katie again in a little bit if there's questions. I can read the questions for oh, you. Oh, thank you, Rama. Yeah, go for it. Do you consider Polyface Farm, Joel Salatin, as a viable example of regenerative agriculture? I think so. I think that he, he is on so many levels. Um, for, for those of you who don't know who Joel Salatin is at Polyface Farm, he is Virginia. I believe he's a Virginia-based um, farmer who is a really, um, he's not Virginia, he's somewhere in that general, that general region. Um, but he, um, he was really one of the early, um, the early people in on this, this movement before it really had a name in this country. Um, and he, he raises all sorts of, um, of animals and some degree of crops. And he does it in this really thoughtful system where he takes in, um, into consideration um, a, a lot around ecology. Um, so one of the things that's so neat about how he manages his farm and that's inspired a lot of other farmers to do similar things is that he'll, he'll move like, for example, cattle through a field and then is, for just a couple of days um, in, into small fields and then move those cattle into the next field so that that grass gets eaten just a little bit. Um, and then you move to the next paddock and then just a little bit. But as those cattle are moving through, they're pooping. Um, and what happens really quickly um, is that flies lay eggs and then you have fly explosions and then you have, um, you know, you have big patties of cow poop um, and that can, you know, if you have a big rain, they wash out, um, those sorts of things. So what, how he deals with that is that he uses um, these little structures um, called chicken tractors that are kind of like a shaded structure that you can pull through a field that, that have pasture-based chickens that live in them. Um, chickens love pulling fly maggots. Sorry, it's really, this is gross, but this is, but this is how nature works. Um, chickens and other birds really love pulling um, maggots out of cow poop. Um, and then in that process of looking for those really protein rich maggots in cow poop, um, the chickens are also flinging poop around everywhere and dispersing it. So they're dispersing that nutrient all across the pasture. Um, and that helps to actually incorporate that manure more, more quickly. Um, and it, it just creates these really, um, these really robust, healthy kind of natural system pastures. Um, so that's a pretty neat example of this idea of regenerative agriculture. It's like, how do we, how do we mimic natural systems? You know, like if you, if you look at um, something like, um, uh, like a nature video of, um, of the plains, you know, like savannas or things like that, you'll see all sorts of um, herds of grazing animals. And always what comes with those herds of grazing animals are birds that literally, you know, follow around those, those animals, um, picking ticks and pulling maggots out of poop and other really undelightful things. Um, but those are natural systems that work together. Other questions, Mama? I can go ahead and jump in if she's not oh, thank here. You. Awesome. Um, the next one is, do you have any information or resources on biochar applications? 
Also, any information or resources on cultivation and use of mushrooms for soil health? Good questions. Um, I will send y'all some, um, some information on biochar. The, um, the branch of United Nations that is kind of like the collecting place for huge amounts of um, biochar research that's being done. And actually, let me back up the stage. Biochar, um, for those of you who don't know what in the world biochar is, um, biochar is um, organic matter, like um, de debris, like kind of woody debris, um, branches, um, parts of trees that are burned down in a really controlled, um, contained temperature with very minimal oxygen. And it's charred down so that all that's left is basically just pure carbon. And then that can be added directly to soil. And it, help, it actually um, is, is becoming quite clear that it is very helpful in the process of restoring soil health and in actually kind of like kickstarting and activating soil's capacity to hold even more carbon. So research around biochar is actually pretty new. So collectively across the world, we don't have, we don't have you know, decades worth of biochar research. Um, and especially with something like trying to alter soil health and try to alter things like that, you really need decades worth of information to show what the long-term impacts of things are. So in terms of long-term impacts, we actually don't really have that information yet about biochar. But what early research is showing is that it's probably actually a very, um, a very productive way to increase um, a lot of soil's capacity to do the things that we know soil needs to be doing. Um, and then the, the kind of the, the collecting house um, within the United Nations of a lot of this research, they update their findings once every seven years. Um, so in 2021, we are due for another um, major update on um, all things climate change related. And within that, they have a big section on biochar. So next year, there's going to be like another big synthesized collection of, of, um, of, of research. So I can send you, I can send you out information um, on biochar as well tomorrow. And then the question on mushrooms. Um, so mushrooms are decomposers. Um, that's what they do. Um, they take organic matter and they basically just, you know, they, they decompose it. Um, so they are part of that system that takes um, really raw organic matter and starts that process of breaking it down into stabilized organic matter. So mushrooms, mushrooms can be a really important piece of that whole system. Um, a lot of folks um, like to put um, um, spent, like the spent grain and things like that from mushroom um, production operations where, um, you know, like big warehouses full of mushroom production. That actually is not, not the most nutritive thing to be adding into your soil and it may, um, you need, definitely need to talk to whoever you're getting that spent mushroom strata from. Um, there is a possibility that it'll be laced with some, with some chemicals, like some antimicrobials and things like that. Um, but, um, but yes, in general, mushrooms, um, mushrooms do tend to be a, um, a really positive part of an environment, um, and they are certainly a really necessary part of the world. Um, mushrooms are a really big piece of making sure that things just don't hang out rotten, um, but actually get broken down and recycled um, through energy and, and nutrient cycling in the world. I see a few more questions, or, or are there a few more questions, rather, that have popped up, or is it? There are. Okay, go ahead. Yep, there's a couple that came in. I'm going to give you this one, though, the most recent, because it's related to the biochar. Okay. Doesn't the process of burning biochar release carbon in the atmosphere? Yeah, so that's, that's part of um, the research that is, um, that is still very much ongoing with biochar, um, is that, yeah, anytime you burn something, there's, there's a lot of carbon that does get released. But the, the process of actually creating biochar is done in such a way that um, it's, it's burned at such a low temperature and it's so enclosed that you actually um, don't lose much of that nitrogen to this, or excuse me, carbon to the system. Um, the vast, vast majority of that carbon gets, um, gets converted just down into like a, basically it looks like chunks of charcoal. Um, so compared to burning as like an open fire, um, it's, a it's a very different process. Um, it's a very closed, closed system process. It's kind of like boiling water in a, in a pressure, um, pressure canner. Um, it's, you know, it's, 
the reason pressure canners work so fast is that you're holding in every last little bit of that heat in a locked system. It's a similar sort of concept. Okay. And actually on the mushroom topic, someone wants to know, they have lots of mushrooms in their yards because of all the rain, which I'm sure we all do. I know I do. Yes. Should they be adding those to their compost or just mowing them over or pulling them? I, um, I let mushrooms just do their thing wherever they are. Um, mushrooms also have big, they're not actually roots, but the easiest way to talk about them is like the roots of a mushroom um, that are, so most of what you're, most of the mushrooms that you're seeing um, actually have kind of a mushroom version of a root system underground that's larger than what you see above ground. Um, so um, they, they're, they're doing their little mushroom thing in place um, and they'll, they'll pop up all over the place and they're very connected underground. So I just, I just let them, let them be. Um, there's clearly something that they're working on decomposing and returning to the system wherever they are. Um, you know, and then when I mow the, mow the grass, sometimes those mushrooms get, get mowed and that's okay. Okay, great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. The next question is, what is the difference between upland and lowland rice? That's a great question. I, will, I can send you all more info about that. Um, the, um, up, up, but the, the, the briefest way to put that is that upland rice is that a lot of rice is grown in extremely steep areas, um, like literally like up the hill or up the mountain. Um, and then, um, and those are areas like you could see in that picture previously, like that, like that terracing system, um, that's, you know, a very steep hill that's been terraced, that's upland rice production, and then flat, like that, that's lowland, that's a, you know, a low, a low-lying flat area. Thank you, Sarah. Mm -hmm. We have two more questions, um, and okay. the first one is, have you toured the agrihood in Loxahatchee? What do you think of the concept of agrihoods? Ooh, good question. I have not toured that particular agrihood. Um, and so for those of you that don't know what an agrihood is, it is basically the idea, and, and actually, so let me back up real quickly. There's a lot of different definitions of what an agrihood is. Um, and kind of the, the general definition that I, that I use for an agrihood, um, and, and, and again, this differs a lot, but is an area um, near an urban area or in an urban area um, where multiple farms um, pop up all, all basically in one spot. So it's kind of like a, you know, a connected series of, of farms um, really, really close to where that food's going to be consumed, um, where farmers can share equipment, they can share resources, they can learn from each other. Um, and I think that they are, they're generally pretty awesome. Um, and I, I know there's, there's many other definitions of agrihood also. So um, I don't know if that actually, if that matches the one that um, the, the question asker is referenced because I've never been there, so I haven't seen it. But I've been to agrihoods in other areas um, that are, they're pretty darn neat. It's a, and it's an amazing way for farmers um, to learn from each other. And um, Katie, for sake of time, I'm going to do a few more slides and then pause again for questions, if that's okay. I know there's... Yeah. Still the an outstanding question, question too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the last question is about um, the meat and animal agriculture being a part of climate change. Okay, great. We're about to dive into that. Anyways. Yep, yes, so ma'am. Okay. So I don't know if you can see the very top of my screen. I can't see the very top of my screen, um, but um, hopefully you can see the very top line, which is that um, livestock, uh, or excuse me, pasture is the largest single um, human use of land on the planet. Um, so if you just break it down into categories, um, pasture of, of all the human things that we do on land, pasture is the, takes up the most amount of land space. Um, so regardless of how you feel about livestock or eating meat or whether or not livestock causes climate change or con contributes to climate change, um, that's the reality that we're working with, is that it, it is the largest human land use on earth. And so we need, we need to work with that reality, right? Um, so one thing um, that is true is that there's a lot of research right now going into this, this whole notion of whether or not um, livestock cause um, 
cause climate change or whether or not livestock are causing a net um, loss of carbon from the system, things like that. And we just, as a scientific community, we don't fully understand yet why grazing and pasture land um, sequesters or captures carbon in some situations and actually causes a net loss in other situations. And the reason I put these two pictures side by side right here um, are to show you two, two kind of polarized views of what two very different types of agriculture look like, right? So this is clearly a very idolized view of what um, cattle grazing in a pasture looks like, right? Like she's even wearing a cowbell. Like it's, it's, it's beautiful, right? Um, and so, you know, obviously not all, not all livestock grazing looks like this, but a lot of it does. You know, a lot of it looks like field, you know, beautiful wildflower fields that have grazing animals in them. And then on the other far polarized side, um, and remember, I was, you know, I was a bare ground vegetable farmer for many years. So I am, I am pointing no fingers in the slightest in anything that I am saying. Um, but this, the picture on the left is what traditional, how we traditionally grow annual, um, annual vegetables and grains, right? With, you know, very large tracts of very bare soil, often on slopes that, that um, are very prone to um, erosion, right? And so when you compare these two pictures, um, it's pretty clear which of these two pictures um, is having a more tangible impact on, on, on climate change, right? And it's not the cow in this, in this, in this very polarized um, sort of view of things, right? So I'm just putting it out there as just to like, just to remember um, that there's a huge spectrum of how we go about this thing we call agriculture and in parallel, how we go about this thing we call landscaping, right? So one thing that we know is that there are, there are patterns that, are, that we're starting to see. Um, scientists are, are looking at global patterns of livestock um, and they're starting to, starting to be able to document um, how, how livestock impact carbon sequestration in different soil types, um, in areas that have different rainfall amounts or different rainfall patterns. You know, does your rain fall all at once or does it fall evenly across the whole year? Um, the type of vegetation growing in pastures, the type of vegetation growing around pastures, um, different pasture management techniques. You know, is it just big open field and cattle can just go in and graze as long as you want? Um, or is it, you know, a very intentional quick rotation system so that things never get overgrazed, right? Those are they're really different. And then different breeds um, and types of livestock. So all of those things are being researched right now. And what is clear is that in some scenarios, um, livestock actually are having a, a positive impact on carbon sequestration. Um, so right now we really can't, um, it's not a black and white scenario. And I think that's a really important thing to embrace. You know, we have a lot more to learn, but it, it is very clear that it's not black and white. So some other, um, some other really neat livestock systems that have been used very traditionally around the world and are starting to pick back up um, in, in places that have lost them as traditions are things like silvopasture. Um, silvopasture is where you literally combine trees and pasture and livestock. Um, into a very intentional system. So like in this picture, you can see sheep um, and then some sort of tree crop. I'm not sure what actually in this picture, what the tree crop is. I think it's some sort of nut crop. Um, but silvopasture is currently practiced on over 350 million acres of land worldwide. And that's, and, and increasing. Um, it's, a, it's a pretty amazing system. Um, and then all sorts of managed grazing systems, um, you know, like the intensive rotational grazing that I was just mentioning. And then, you know, and if you still feel very, very skeptical <laughs> about this whole idea that, that livestock are not just a, you know, just a bad thing across the board in terms of, of how we produce food, um, I would really encourage you to look at how, um, how livestock were traditionally raised in other parts of the world. Um, you know, like I really like this picture of um, a Scot Scottish Highlands um, cow grazing in the high mountains in Scotland. You know, this is, this is a region where um, people, people do live um, and people do need, need to eat. Um, and, as a, and as a place that likes to be self-sufficient and not import their food in from everywhere else, um, the best thing they can do with that land 
is because it's so steep and it's so cold and it's so rugged is never till that land. Um, and so in this circumstance, um, you know, things like cattle um, are actually probably the best agricultural land use for that area. Um, you know, and then the picture that you see on the right um, of the little boy with a goat, right? You know, in a lot of areas, you know, a family has just a handful of, of animals that live in, you know, in these kind of wild, um, wild, beautiful areas. Um, and so they, they are able to provide a really, um, a really substantial part of a family's caloric intake through milk or eggs or whatever it might be. Um, so there's, there's so many ways to go about livestock, right? And we tend to see things in this very black and white way. Um, so this is just a reminder to that it turns out it's actually not as black and white um, as sometimes we would like life to be. <laughs> um, are there questions that have come up with that, Katie? There was one question. Um, do you feel we need to change our eating habits and the way we eat livestock? That's a great question. Um, there, man, there are like a million and one different opinions on that. I have, I've gone through the entire, the entire spec, like personally, I've gone through the entire spectrum of, um, you know, growing up hunting with my dad through, I, um, I spent a, a stretch of time vegan. I spent many years vegetarian. Um, I incorporated um, animal products back into my diet, but for a long time, it was really important for me to actually meet an animal before I ate an animal. Um, you know, and so there's, you know, there, I, I, I personally have gone through so many different iterations of, of what it, how we should be eating and what it's, you know, how, how our personal choices impact the greater world. Um, you know, and, and on a personal level, I don't really have, I don't really Feel like I have that answer. Um, I'm still in the process of figuring it out, and the more the more I learn, and the more I see um, agricultural um, production in many different settings, um, the less I have that answer. I've um, over the last 20 years, I've been on my best guess is about a thousand farms, and and I can and I can tell you that some of the most um, the most sustainable and natural farms. That I've been on have been farms that are primarily livestock farms and some of the farms that are probably doing the most impact are farms that are growing vegetables you know so and I, I love vegetables if I had to only boil my own personal diet down to one food category I would probably go with vegetables I, I love annual vegetables I just do you know and so um, I am personally never probably never going to stop eating annual vegetables um, despite the fact that I know that a lot of annual vegetable production is done in ways that um, that result in a lot of carbon being lost to our environment and in a lot of bare soil, right? So it's it's just a really hard it's a really hard answer, and it's a really um, circumstantial sort of answer. Um, and there's there's some really neat places that you can that you can visit um, around around the country and around the world and you know, and around Florida if you're a Florida-based person to help you kind of ponder some of some of this very complicated sort of question. Um, one of my favorites is actually this place in Fort Myers, Florida, on the southwest coast of Florida, um, and it's called Echo Global Farm. And this is um, this is the, clearly a YouTube video um, that's from their website. So if you want to, if you are you don't live anywhere near Fort Myers, Florida, and want to get a, a little glimpse about what they're doing, um, watch their YouTube video, and I'll send you that link tomorrow as well. Um, but it's a really, really neat, neat place. Um, and they have basically recreated um, kind of like um, uh, subsistence farm versions of what um, best practices of being a subsistence farm is in various parts of the world. Um, you know, like all across kind of the subtropical and tropical band of the world, um, as well as some demonstrations of what that could look like on a slightly larger scale. Like you can see the greenhouse in the back of, of the picture that you see on your screen. Um, and one of the things that they've done is figured out really sustainable ways to integrate um, kind of like small, small scale livestock into a lot of these little demonstrations for all, all over their 300 acre property. It's pretty, it's pretty phenomenal. And they've, they've developed ways in which the whole system relies on the whole system, where if you take livestock out of the system, it kind of falls apart. Um, and if you take the plants out of, out of the system um, and just leave, you know, basic pasture, the whole system kind of falls apart. So they're, they're in that process of kind of reintegrating those two things. It's 
pretty neat. Um, other, are there other questions that popped up, Katie? Not right now, no. Okay, sounds good. We're getting super close to the end of the slides and then we'll have a few minutes left at the end. So kind of to pull it all back around to where we started. Um, so regenerative agriculture and landscaping is it's truly just this collection of practices with the intent of restoring degraded land, right? And so any one of these things that we've talked about and some of these that we actually didn't talk about for, you know, for lack of time, integrating any of these things into how you currently manage your, 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 your front yard, your backyard, your small farm, your huge farm, or anything in between really goes a really long way towards restoring degraded land and having that impact on the, the soil's ability to hold carbon, um, which is in everyone's best interest. So on, you know, so some really concrete things that we can do towards this end is things like minimizing clearing land. So as we're, as we're doing, you know, development, um, keeping some of those trees, not clear cutting whole spaces as we develop new land. Um, preventing the drainage of wetlands, that goes a really long way. Wetlands hold a lot of carbon. Um, preventing erosion, um, as much as possible, stopping the process of tilling land, um, really intentionally improving soil health, um, minimizing the use of mechanical equipment, decreasing the use of nitrogen fertilizer in particular. Um, the actual manufacturing process of nitrogen, of, of, um, of chemical nitrogen, is actually very energy intensive. Um, so that's, that's where a lot of the, the, um, the environmental impact of nitrogen fertilizer comes from, is actually from the manufacturing process. Um, and then improving, improving how we're using fertilizer, because we're not going to stop using fertilizer. That's, you know, that, that's probably never going to happen. Um, we, you know, that's, that's become a really necessary thing to, to, how, we, to how we feed a whole planet. Um, but improving... Um, and improving how we use that, that fertilizer is really important through things like the timing and the quantity that we're using. And if, you're, if you live in Florida and you have a landscape, um, a really good way to learn about that is by delving into the Florida Friendly Landscaping Guide or taking a Florida Friendly Landscaping class. Um, and then in farm systems or big gardens, um, replacing um, fertilizer, you know, like bagged fertilizer with things like composted manure or cover crops. Um, and then this idea of closing, closing the loops. Um, so starting to rethink about these things that we call waste and realizing that some of these things we call waste are actually nutrients waiting to happen. So for example, all of those leaves that we love raking up and shoving in bags and putting at the end of the driveway for the dump truck to come pick up and take to the dump, right? Um, those bags of leaves are not waste. They are the beginning of new soil. Right, so remember at the very beginning, we took a look at, um, at this diagram and that very top layer of soil, that O horizon, that surface litter layer, um, that's the beginning of new soil. Um, those leaves are organic matter. Those leaves are beginning of that cycle of soil and of holding carbon in the soil. So I highly recommend um, if you are someone who um, has spent many years um, raking leaves and hauling them off, which takes a, a lot of time as well, um, think about instead setting the, um, the setting on your lawnmower to the mulch, um, mulch setting instead, and actually just mow those leaves right in place and they'll, they will return back into the soil. Um, and then creating fertility in place through things like compost. Um, if you happen to be in the Sarasota area, um, there's lots of resources for that, including um, a group called Sunshine Community Compost. They teach, they teach lots of um, classes and do community-based composting. Um, our office has a waste reduction agent in it, um, and he teaches a really popular series of classes called Black Gold Composting. They're great classes. Um, and then um, starting that process of actually capturing your food waste um, in place um, and maybe composting at home, either in a backyard composting system or inside with a worm bin um, or something like that. Have, have worms eat your compost. And then it's also really important um, simply to, um, in your gardens and your landscapes, um, to keep your soil covered. Keep that soil covered. Um, bare soil um, loses organic matter and therefore carbon 
really, really quickly. It loses life really quickly when it's not covered. And so in our area, um, through a lot of the Southeast, um, Spanish moss actually makes a great soil mulch um, in your garden space, um, as do pine needles, um, wood chips, um, plants that you can just kind of chop and drop right in place. Um, you have to be a little careful in a lot of the Southeast with seaweed and mulch straw. Um, some, sea, some kinds of seaweed actually are, are pretty high in, in arsenic naturally. Um, so seaweed you got to be a little careful with. Other parts of the country don't have the arsenic issue. Um, and then mulch straw in or like hay bales is kind of what people normally call it. Um, in most of the country you don't have much issue with. Down here you might run into an issue um, because they're um, because of persistent herbicide use on hay fields. So just be a little, little cautious with hay. Um, that you can see, um, that's a farm setting. That's actually an on-campus farm in Gainesville I used to manage where we would do side-by-side -side, um, demonstrations um, with students. Um, and you can see these two beds of lettuce that were planted on the same day out of the same trays and treated in exactly the same way, except that one, one of these beds of lettuce was mulched and the other wasn't. So you can really see visually in this picture the impact of just keeping your soil covered, right? Plants Plants are a whole lot happier with, with, with covered soil. Um, and then I will, I will, I know we're running out of time, so I'm just gonna speed through this last little bit, but I'll send you this as well. Um, Florida friendly landscaping is based on these really concrete principles that, that really are kind of like the landscaping version of regenerative agriculture. It's all about, um, all about how, we're, how we're protecting that land that we're living on. And I just would love to encourage folks um, to just really, you know, like think about this stuff um, and um, be, be an active part of changing what is normal in how we go about agriculture and landscaping, right? We need a, we need a change. Um, and um, that is a change that's going to have to come by people being inspired to inspire other people to that change as well. And I just want to leave you with this last little quote um, by Wangari Mathai. Hopefully y'all remember, she is the amazing, um, amazing Kenyan woman who inspired the planting of 11 billion trees across Africa. Um, and she says, it's the little things, uh, it's the little things citizens do. That's what makes the difference. My little thing is planting trees. And her inspiration, her little thing of planting trees has absolutely um, revolutionized the, um, the, basically the environmental health of an entire region of the world. Um, so hopefully you will also find a lot of inspiration from Wangari Mathai um, and some of the other things that you learned today. So that is what I have for you. Um, and I will go ahead and take some more questions. And I'm gonna stop sharing this screen so I can actually see people's faces. There we go. Okay. I'm ready, Katie. The first question is, what's the best soil cover for an herb garden? That's a great question. Um, it depends a little bit on where in the country you live. Um, and um, this would normally be a really easy question to, to answer because we usually do all of our, our classes in person. So I, I know where people live. Um, but um, OK, so you're in Largo, Florida. Thank you. There we go. So with Largo, Florida, um, a good a good herb garden, excuse me, herb garden cover um, for your um, or good soil cover for your herb garden. Whew, um, can't get those words out. Um, really thick layer of Spanish moss works great, um, and it's you know it's something that's probably dropping from trees in your yard or your neighborhood anyway. Um, so it's a really good natural one to just keep feeding back into the system. Um, herb gardens. Um, is if you're talking about like woody perennial herbs, um, like um, like in the Largo area, y'all are probably growing things like Cuban oregano and things like that, lemongrass, I'm guessing, that, those sorts of things, maybe, maybe also some basil. Um, but some of the woodier, woody plants tend to do really well with woody mulches. Okay, so parsley, dill, fennel. Okay, um, so woody plants tend to do best with woody mulches, like wood chips and things like that. Um, and then um, more tender um, herbs, things like parsley, dill, fennel, um, basil, those sorts of things, tend to do better with um, non-woody mulches. So things like um, um, freshly mowed grass, if, if you know, or, or 
or composted grass if you know that there's no herbicide on that grass, um, or mulch straw or hay if you know there's no herbicide potential on that, that, that hay. Um, Spanish moss, um, you actually can use pine needles. A lot of people feel like pine needles are gonna acidify their soil, but as long as you don't incorporate those pine needles, you're not gonna get a huge um, acid effect from, um, from those pine needles. And in a lot of really coastal parts of Florida, we actually have really alkaline soil so a little bit of extra acid in your soil is not a bad thing. Questions? Okay. The next question is, what are your thoughts on the use of alpha pellets for nitrogen instead of using synthetic fertilizer for vegetable gardening? Alpha, alpha pellets? Yes. I think, yeah, that, and, um, and Fred, is that a question from you, Fred? Yes. And Fred, and my apologies, you asked me that before and I never actually did go and follow up and learn more about it. So um, my, initial, my initial thought on alfalfa pellets in place of, of fertilizer um, is that um, alfalfa pellets probably have a decent um, nutrient um, uh, count on them. You know, like nitrogen, potassium, phosphorus, probably some micronutrients. Um, I don't know how, how high that count is um, of, of the different nutrients that plants need. Um, but, you know, so it may not, you may end up needing to use more of it or more frequently because it'll break down really quickly compared to um, animal-based or, um, or um, synthetic fertilizers. Um, anything that's plant-based breaks down quite quickly, especially down here. Um, so if you actually, if you have a, um, a label from, that gives you the, the nutrient, um, the nutrient count, um, if you send it my way, I'll take a look at it, and then I can tell you better what I think about it. <laughs> and that was the last question, unless there's any other questions out there. Sounds good. Okay, I'm going to start wrapping it up then. Thank you all enormously for joining. I hope that um, you learned a lot, and I'm guessing that um, many of you probably are going away with more questions and answers, but um, that's, that's actually kind of exactly what I was hoping to inspire, was just some really deep thinking about things, because this, this is a whole set of concepts that really is pretty new, um, and it's one that um, we're still figuring out on a lot of levels, but it's, you know, one thing that is very clear is that we do have a lot of power to change how we do things, um, and that's a pretty amazing thing. Um, and so thank you all so very much for, um, for joining, and I really appreciate it. See y'all next time.